first time I watched the video was very disturbing. I'm being told that they tried saving Eric Lurie. It's a horrible cover-up. I said, I can't believe these are officers that I knew that did this to this man. Come on, let's go. Gets to the point where they get to the station, and next thing you know, another officer comes in on the opposite side, and next thing you know, he slaps Eric Lurie really hard in the face and says, wake up, bitch. Wake up, bitch. Let's, let's go. go. Goes for his throat. Open your mouth. I kept thinking, let go of his nose. Let go of his nose. Let go of his nose. Minute and 38 seconds. You try holding your breath for a minute and 38 seconds. Looks up at the camera. Now the audio gets cut out. Audio doesn't get cut out by accident. Eric Lurie wasn't combative in the backseat of the squad car. He was incoherent. He looked like he needed medical attention. To me, it was worse than what happened to George Floyd. We have the impression that when we point the finger internally and we blow the whistle internally on something that is not right, we expect to be rewarded for that. I mean, that's integrity, you know? And I think what shocks people in policing who, who whistle blow is that that's not the case. That you're regarded as a traitor. That you have committed an act of treason against the organization and they treat you like a traitor. If there's any way that they can, they being executive management, they can keep things quiet, they will. You're either part of that group, the inner circle, or you're not. And if you do things on the straight and narrow all the time, or you do the righteous thing, you're not gonna be in that group. When you're talking about being a whistleblower in law enforcement, you're whistleblowing against the culture and the culture is trained in weapons. And if you've seen them use it in a way that you do not think is uh, lawful, what's to prevent that from happening to you or being used against you? So the officers are afraid to do anything. It's fear through retaliation. You tell me why this video didn't come out until I wound up blowing the whistle on it over five, six months later. Chief Rochner told everybody that I endangered the entire police department for what I did by showing that video. I've been representing Joliet police officers since 1992. This is all about the next guy. This is all about this what happens if you speak out. I'm charged with four felonies for official misconduct, policy violations made into criminal offenses. You could do up to six years in prison, six on one count. If I'm convicted of a felony, I lose my entire pension of 28 years. God bless any police officer that will raise his hand and say, hey, this, this just wasn't right. I mean, there's no holds barred when they come at you like this. Not that I lost respect for law enforcement, I lost a love for it. I lost a love for my career, I lost a love for everything I did. Never thought the people in the department would actually lie to get me indicted. I don't trust them. I grew up in what is known as the ghetto, the Desire Housing Project. 
And it was me and my brother, Rudolph Thomas. We are twins, by the way. We were sitting together one night in the living room, and we were discussing, hey, man, you know, we need to try to do something and try to improve our quality of living. And it was from there I went to the police academy in September. I was the first one to be hired. I was hired in July, I remember my, my appointment date, July 31st, 1975. Rudolph was hired months later, six months later, in December. Republicans and Democrats. In the early 80s, then Mayor Ernest Moriel, Moriel understood that there was a problem with police, policing police. I mean, the citizen had been calling for this for years. You know, cover-ups just appeared to be the norm. One of the things that I found was troublesome, I used, we heard it in the academy, which I believe is what caused some of the problems among police, even until today, this culture of us having this brotherhood, and it extends, man, right now in most police departments. This is like a fraternity. Thank God for Mary Howell, who was my attorney, uh, who handled my case through 82, actually. Mary Howell eventually filed suit in federal court. It was an all-white jury, heard the evidence, and they agreed that those officers, along with the chief, they did conspire. And they put together lies in a report that resulted in my termination. And that jury said, not only did you violate his civil rights, but the manner in which you, that it was done, it was with malice. And because it was with malice, we're going to assess punitive damages against you for that. I think about a month later, the judge took into consideration everything that was done in court, and he issued an order of reinstatement. That, that's, 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 a, that's a difficult question to answer because do I feel betrayed by some, but not by all. You, you feel know? betrayed by the system? The current system, yeah. You know, when those officers do say something, people that see my situation realize, damn, you've lost everything. You sacrificed it, you lost everything. So why would somebody else put themselves in my shoes knowing that they're gonna risk everything, lose, your house, lose your car, lose your family, lose everything that you worked hard for for all these years to speak out to a system that still isn't going to support you. Narcotics division is a very important part of law enforcement. In Baton Rouge, that's where most of your crimes committed. I saw a lot of things going on that I didn't agree with. Uh, drugs being planted on individuals, search warrants being done without proper consent. I've seen them utilize street level prostitutes to set up drug dealers illegally. So when I spoke to the administration and voiced my concern, I was told that it would be dealt with. And obviously, after speaking to the administration, the supervisor in narcotics found out that I had spoken with the administration. And so I had been receiving information from other people that they were trying to come after me, which I didn't think I was doing anything wrong, so I didn't think I had anything to worry about. Ultimately, uh, the supervisors, along with another detective in the office, retaliated against me by uh, using a confidential informant to set me up. My attorney and I felt as though it was a safety issue because people get desperate. It's no telling what extent they'll go to to try and hurt you or discredit you. So we felt as though it would be better for me to go ahead and resign from the department. Oh, okay. Come on, put your shoes on. Okay. 
Oh, Pate, about to get killed to come do your hair. Pate. Some days, you know, it, it, it is difficult to even wake up the next morning because it is very, very rough. You know, you wish that you didn't say anything, that you just would have let it take its course, and then I, I still would have had a job, I still would have been employed, I still would have had benefits, you know, for my kids as far as health insurance, which I've lost all that. You hear from the police officials from time to time, you know, always bad apples. Yeah, but what are you doing to weed them out? We could do our job. Law enforcement officers can do their jobs and do it the right way without violating other people's rights. If there's hostility against police, huh? it's because of incidents like that. And when it's complained about, in many instances, they don't see justice. I believe that's how you're going to break that culture. That culture of trying to protect other officers when they know they are bad apples. Justice starts with police, man. My experience with police, police control the flow of a lot of information. You remember that. I felt like any time I could put in the effort to do something wrong, I could do it to do something right. All right. The last time I saw him was January the 28th. We were going to renew our vows on February the 16th. I found out that there was recording of Eric five months later. So that tells me all of the months of me going down there trying to figure out what happened, what's going on, and why I can't get a police report, that video tells me why. I, mean, I go from planning a wedding, a vow renewal, to planning a funeral. I was a widow, trying to raise two boys. It stressed me out so bad. And then also, we had been trying for so long after me seeing that video. Uh, I, I tried to keep my stress level down as much as I possibly could, but it's just, it was so much going on um, that I ended up having this condition. Years down the tubes. My first day back, I walked into the station. There was people that I knew that I didn't know anymore. The faces they would give me, the way they would look at me in disgust and turn around. They acted like I killed somebody. It's unwritten, but I believe it's there that retaliation uh, would follow if you decide that you're not going to go along just to get along. Yes, that's part of the culture, man, that police work under. And they know that. But uh, he might have put a bunch of it in his mouth. As a nurse, as a professional, I saw multiple opportunities, multiple opportunities that they had to save my cousin's life. And at every opportunity they had, they chose not to. Come on, let's go. Hey, wake up, bitch. Let's go. And you need to make sure that this doesn't happen again. You need to make sure that there are changes. As a former prosecutor, I think they were in evidence recovery mode when they should have been in uh, emergency medical mode. It's bullying with a reputation aspect. It's bullying with a financial aspect. It's bullying with your career, with your calling. Basically, if somebody calls me and they have a job that is something that I can do, then I'll do my best to get out there and try and get it done. Uh, so I do have a farming business that, that I started uh, where I butcher and sell livestock. So even if I make $20 a day, I mean, that's, that's a, a meal that I can put on the table for my kids. But uh, right now, with the financially, that money needs to go in the house to take care of the kids instead of me having to take care of all these animals. So 
Uh, hopefully things will get better soon. That's very unfair. My sister named it. <laughs> and you know, I feel like when you have to give up something that, that you love so much, whether it's worldly possessions or even emotionally, or that's hard to go through. It takes a toll on you. It's not really fixing the problem. And then the officers, the supervisors that were over that division, y'all transferred them out of there. But they weren't disciplined, nothing happened to them. They can go to uniform and do the same thing they were doing in narcotics. The only difference is they have a uniform on now. I'm sure there are gonna be some people, man, who's not gonna like what I've said on this camera. But if you're telling the truth, why should it bother anybody? Truth only bothers people, man, who know they're doing wrong, who know they're perpetrating out here against the innocent. I really enjoyed my work. I really did. I enjoyed being out there among the people. I look forward to coming home to my family, my wife, Cassandra. Uh, we, we got 41 years together. Three of our sons are in law enforcement right now. What you've heard me say about police being accountable and respectful, huh? that goes for them too. Giving you a badge and a gun isn't going to make you the good police officer. It's going to corrupt the power that you have to take somebody's life or take their freedom away. But I want to see law enforcement changed. I want to see where people believe that there's more good cops. We have to figure out a way in policing to make sure that everybody has a voice. If we always err on the side of integrity and we listen to the public when the public asks questions and scrutinizes our work, um, we will always come out on top. I just want to see police reform all throughout this whole country, but I want to see a true whistleblower reform that protects law enforcement. What they have out there right now is a joke. Because I can tell you there's probably, out of 750,000 plus officers, I bet you there's a third of them that have seen something that they, had, that they can't speak about because they're afraid it's going to happen to them what happened to me. With regarding to Officer Javier Escada, I'm extremely grateful for what he has done, for bringing the video forward because he opened up the light and open up oh, so many eyes here in our little town. I would think my husband, Eric, I think that he would be very proud that I'm standing and still fighting to get justice for him. You know, sometimes doing the right thing does cost you. Uh, it does hurt you financially, it does hurt you mentally, but in the end, you know you did the right thing. It has to be change. Biggest fear, no change at all, then you're gonna have more Eric Lurie's, more George Floyd's, more wasted lives. I hate this stuff. <laughs> I've spent my life addressing this foolishness, man. I've been ridiculed, I've been ostracized, I've been felt the pain, the misery for wanting to see it done right. That's why I'm passionate about it, man. But I'm not one who's willing to give up because there is hope. We may not can curb it all, but we can curb the majority of it. This time we bring common sense back to policing.